Um, so I, I, I do want us to talk a little bit about the process that you'd just gone through um, with the nomination and the hearings uh, and the eventual vote um, that just took place. I kind of want, you know, to have our, our constituents be brought into your thinking process as you were preparing to confront what some of um, your colleagues have called it an, an illegitimate process. I've called it a hypocritical illegitimate process because in 2016, when President Obama nominated Merrick Garland to fill the position of uh, Justice Scalia, that's when McConnell comes forward with what he calls the McConnell rule. And he had already set the stage to make sure that all his Republican uh, senators were totally in line with them. And he had told them ahead of time, this is what we're going to do. And the McConnell rule says that uh, uh, during the year of an election, the people should decide who the next president should be and therefore who should pick the next nominee. All of that was totally out the, out the window. And it's just awesome to think that the words like hypocrisy, being hypocrites, it doesn't, uh, it falls on deaf ears. Right. And in fact, he calls us hypocrites, which is kind of amazing because Mitch McConnell has a, has a way of turning the very thing that he's doing against those people who aren't doing it. So he is masterful uh, in, in the way that he carries out his cruelty. And, and what, and what a, what a uh, tremendous, uh, it's more than a disservice. It's a, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's last wish, well, her most fervent wish, was that her replacement would be uh, would be someone who the people, the next president, would choose after the election. And um, within three days, President Trump had already nominated Amy Coney Barrett because mainly for a number of reasons, but the first one being that he wanted someone who would overturn the Affordable Care Act, which millions and millions of people in our country rely upon for their health care and worse in the middle of a pandemic and then he wanted someone who would overturn roe v wade and she has uh, definitely a uh, it indicated her uh, opposition to the affordable care act when she criticized chief justice roberts for his decision in 2012 to uphold the act so uh, I've concluded that were she on the Supreme Court then, she would have joined her mentor, Antonin Scalia, to, to basically get rid of the Affordable Care Act. So she's made her position clear, even if while we, she was testifying, she said, oh, I can't talk about that, you know, all of that. But we got very little from her regarding um, her position on just about anything. She couldn't even commit to the fact that a president should commit to an orderly transition of power. She couldn't commit to that. She wouldn't respond when we said uh, there's voter suppression and voter intimidation and all of that going on. She said, well, I can't uh, respond to that either. So, you know, what we were left with were her writings, her past positions on, on issues that are going to affect all of us. And so, this was a rush process so that she could be sitting there to hear the Affordable Care Act case on November 10th. And mm -hmm. this is the first time in 150 years that someone gets put onto the Supreme Court without a single bipartisan vote. There was not a single Democrat who voted for her. Yeah. So for any number of reasons, this is a, this, this was a, uh, we call it an Ill illegitimate process. But fell on deaf ears. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so of our three branches, um, the, the the judiciary or the Supreme Court has one of the lowest approval ratings with um, the the United States electorate, and I think it's like a ten percent approval rating. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder. Um, what this process does to um, a system that we need to function and to have legitimacy um, that is now going to have someone be part of it who's not seen as a legitimate appointee, um, certainly with the way that the process went, with, with you know, the vote being so partisan, um, 
what what does it mean uh, for you know the the future history of the court? The clear and present danger of uh, Amy Barrett being on the court, of course, is to the Affordable Care Act. But there are many precedents that she's already indicated that, in her view, as a Supreme Court justice, uh, res uh, responsibility is to assess what her view of the Constitution is, and then if there's a precedent that is contrary. Uh, clearly contrary in her view to her own assessment of, of what the Constitution requires, then there goes the precedent. So Obergefell, for example, the right of same-sex couples to marry, that is subject to uh, being overturned. Clearly Roe v. Wade, a woman's right to choose. Um, okay. You have voting rights cases. In fact, just recently, the Supreme Court tied four to four to a, a Pennsylvania case that would enable the state of Pennsylvania to count votes beyond the for three days after the election because with the with the mail mail being what it is there can be delays and even those people who have postmarked their ballots before election and then you have the Supreme Court Judge Justice Kavanaugh writing another opinion similar a Wisconsin case letting the Wisconsin um, Wisconsin not count the ballots. So these issues, you know, the voter suppression that we know is going on, especially in minority communities where you have people having to stand in line for hours and hours on end. My God, you know, your 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 friend EOS, she said she stood in line for two hours to vote in New York. So yeah. all of this is going on. And I do think that uh, court reform is something that I've been thinking about for a number of years. And I know you uh, have some thoughts about what we ought to do to balance the court because it is highly skewed now to the right, which means that the protections and the battles that we thought we had won for individual protections, workers' rights, those can all fall by the wayside. So uh, I, I have been thinking about court reform for a number of years. But that only happens if the Democrats take back the Senate and if we have a president who is open to the kind of balance that we need in the highest court in the land, not to mention throughout the judiciary. Yeah. I mean, and I, I know that we are um, having a, a town hall on immigration. Uh, and so I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that there are a lot of immigrants in our yes. country who are worried <laughs> about what this in balance in the court mm -hmm. means for them. Can you yeah. speak a little bit to that? Well, one of the issues that really impacts the immigrant community is the public charge rule. And uh, there was a case in Judge Barrett's circuit where she wrote a dissent saying that uh, because her circuit had found the public charge rule to be confusing and all of that. So they said, no, we shouldn't have it implemented. But she wrote a dissent saying, it should be implemented uh, that that uh, the fact that the immigrant communities are afraid of the, the public charge rule, even if it would not apply to them. She she recognized that there was fear throughout the immigrant community on the, the application of the public charge rule to the point where many of them were not even accessing resources and government programs that uh, including things like food stamps and, you know, those programs that they were entitled to because they were afraid that they would be deported or something bad would happen to their family. So she recognized this. And yet she said uh, she thought that the, uh, the, the administration had followed the proper procedures to institute the public charge rule. And she wrote a, I think, a 40 page opinion, a dissent. I think I'm one of the few people who actually read it. And so it just goes to show that she does not. She had strong opinions to write 40 pages. Yeah, of dissent, supporting the public charge rule. She went into a whole history, but what she didn't adequately consider was the real life impact of the decisions that the Supreme Court would be making. And that's something that Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, the court should pay attention to the impact. For example, if you get rid of the Affordable Care Act, every minority communities, blacks, immigrant communities will be particularly hard hit by the fact that they will no longer have access to health care. And so when we asked her, well, what about the 100 million people plus who have pre-existing conditions, she says that's a policy issue that Congress should address, which means that she's not paying adequate attention to the real life impact 
of the decisions that the Supreme Court will make. That is not where we need the court to be. Ruth Bader Ginsburg said many of her dissents had to do with uh, the, the court, other members of the court not paying attention to the real world impact of what they were saying, or what they were deciding. So yes, this court is going to have uh, in, an impact on all of our lives, but I would say the particularly hard hit will be immigrant immigrants, um, you know, who can be deported, who can come into our country, all of these, uh, who can vote. These are all issues that will come before this court, I believe, yeah. eventually.